Hello, Hugo Reed. I have a book today called Just As Good, How Larry Doby Changed America's Game. So many of you have probably heard of Jackie Robinson, Larry Doby. Let's see what it says inside the cover. Ever since the year 1947, when their man, Larry Doby, followed Jackie Robinson across baseball's color line and signed on with their team, the Cleveland Indians. And today, Larry Doby and the Indians are playing game four of the World Series against the Boston Braves. So that's in this book. It's about game four of the World Series, the Cleveland Indians against the Boston Braves. So this is written by Chris Cow and illustrated by Mike Benny. So this is a name some of you may not have heard. That's why I'm reading it today. Larry Doby. He was eventually inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. So this is taking place, it said, in 1947. So there's their stadium. Just as good. Hold that so you can see it better. Daddy and I love the Cleveland Indians, and when Larry Doby joined them last season, we both hoped that 1947 would be a year to remember. A Negro on our team, Daddy shouted when he read the news. First one in the American League. It's a miracle, I said. I've been aching for a miracle ever since Coach O'Brien banned me from his Little League team. Look around, Homer, he said. You see any Negroes playing in the major leagues? Jackie Robinson, he's already a star in Brooklyn. That boy's a fluke, Coach laughed. Ain't no other Negro ball player worth a spit. Right then, I wanted one of our own here in Cleveland playing for my Indians. That would prove that Jackie's for real, and that would show that our people are just as good in baseball or anything else as the whites are. Of course, I knew it was a crazy dream until Larry Doby showed up. So the coach told this little boy he couldn't play baseball on the team because blacks didn't play, which they called Negroes at the time. That wasn't kind at all, was it? But that was happening in all kinds of places, work, churches sports. So he's saying, but Jackie Robinson can play, but the coach said, oh, that's just a fluke. That means that's out of the ordinary. That's not normal. So he's now hoping they'll get one on their team. The Cleveland Indians is his favorite team. Sunday, October 9th, 1948. I get up early for my paper route and Cleveland buzzes with excitement over the World Series. Some people are already on the street corner scalping tickets for the big game. Others see my Cleveland Indians cap and call out, How about those Indians? I'm hoping to get home soon and finish my chores so I can go down to Standard Drugs and listen to the game. I don't get there early enough. I'll have to stand outside. That would be no good at all. So they go to the drugstore to listen to the game on the radio because people didn't have TVs in their homes and they, most people, a lot of people didn't even have a radio in their home. So they'd go to the store where they sold the radio or where they had a radio and listen to the game. That's how they knew what was going on. I get home just after one o'clock and mama's in the kitchen shaking her head. New radios don't come for free, she's telling daddy. We've got bills to be paying. Daddy just smiles and keeps on working with that brand new radio. I can't believe it. We got a radio? Won't be as good as being in Cleveland Stadium, Daddy says, but it sure beats standing in the drugstore. You too, Mama chuckles as she leaves the kitchen. You are baseball crazy. Danny's grin Daddy's grinning like a birthday boy. Are you ready for this, Homer? I nod and pull my cap low. Daddy turns that radio on. The dial glows. In a few seconds, music floats out. Daddy starts turning that dial like a safe cracker. News, crackly static, big band music. Then I hear, good afternoon, baseball fans everywhere. My heart thumps. That's him, Daddy, Mel, Mel Allen. 
Mel Ellen's been calling all the World Series games. Daddy turns up the radio and we sit down to listen to the starting lineup. We cheer when we hear that Larry's starting in center field, but Daddy's worried about the pitcher. Steve Gromick, he said, he'll need help. Be he'll need help beating the Braves. Good thing he's got our man, Larry Doby, I say. Our man is the man. Daddy gives me a thumbs up. Boston, Boston bats first, and I'm so jittery I can hardly listen. But Gromek gets out of the inning without giving up a man. Daddy slaps me on the back. Here we go now. Yay, Indians, I shout. When the Indians come up to bat, our leadoff batter, left fielder Dale Mitchell, tips a single, and our cheers drowned out the radio. Then we hear Mel Allen say, that brings to the plate Larry Doby, currently the leading hitter in the series. I'm shaking as if I'm standing at the plate in Cleveland Stadium myself. Come on, Larry, I whisper. Larry smashes a line drive, and Mel Allen has to shout over the noise of the crowd, Doby's vicious grounder is knocked down, and he's out at first. I jump into my chair, but I'm up again when I see Lou Bondro, Cleveland's shortstop, drives in a run. Way to go, I shout. That's our Indians, Daddy yells. Mama sticks her head in the door. Good news? Mama, I say, we're already ahead, one to nothing. She sits down and puts an arm across my shoulders. Then I'm staying put. Don't want to be missing history. Nobody scores in the next inning, and Daddy and I start pacing in the kitchen. We need another run, he said. Just one more, because there's no way Gromek can keep the Braves from scoring. In the third inning, Larry Doby comes to bat. Daddy reaches over and squeezes my hand. He's going to do it, he says. I can just feel it. He'll do it, I tell Daddy. He's just got to do it. Larry swings and misses the first pitch. I close my eyes while Mel Ellen describes the next pitch. I hear the sharp crack of the bat and the roar of the crowd, and Mel's voice is getting louder and louder. It's high and deep to the right center field. The ball is going. It's going. It's gone. The crowd cheers. I'm sorry. The cheers drowned out Mel Allen. Larry Doby just teed off with the first home run of the 1948 World Series and the Indians lead to nothing. Ooh. You can imagine the crowd cheering, can't you? Mama and Daddy and I are dancing in the kitchen, whooping and hollering until our voices go hoarse. Then Daddy pulls Mama into his arms. Our man is a World Series hero, he said. Mama sits back down to listen while Daddy and I start pacing the kitchen again. Oh, sometimes it's hard when you're watching a team you want to win so badly. In the seventh inning, Boston's left fielder, Marv Rickert hammers a home run to make the score two to one. And for the rest of the game, Daddy and I are up and down with every out, pleading with the Indians to hang on to their one run lead. Gromick finally gets the last out of the game and Daddy hugs Mama and then picks up me and twirls me around the kitchen. We are on our way, he said. Change is a coming, Homer. When he sets me down, I see tears in his eyes. In the morning, Daddy comes outside to help me fold my newspapers. But what he really wants to do is read about our new hero. He pulls the paper off the stack and turns right to the sports section. So what kind of change are they talking about? He says change is coming. It's change that they're hoping that the white people will start to see that the black people can do things just as well. And baseball is the start to show 
that it's changing. We really are just as good. Smack in the middle of the page is a photograph of Larry Doby and Steve Gromick celebrating yesterday's wins. Both have smiles as wide as Lake Erie and they're cheek to cheek, a white face next to a black one, hugging each other like brothers. Look at that, Daddy said. Will you just look at that? Change ain't a coming, Homer. It's already here. So before this, there probably had not been any pictures of ever people of different colors hugging. So that was huge. And then it tells more information about Larry Doby, which is pretty interesting if you want to check this book out. There are a few quotes from Larry Doby here, which I think are really interesting. This one says, the things I was called did hurt me. They hurt a lot. The things people did to me, spitting tobacco juice on me, sliding into me, throwing baseballs at my head. The words they called me, they do hurt, Larry Doby said. So he kept going, but it wasn't easy. People were doing really mean things to him, both players and fans. And this quote says, that hug by Gromick made me feel good because it was not a thing of should I or should I not. It was a thing of black or white, not a thing of black or white. It was a thing where human beings were showing emotion. So it was just, they weren't acting like, what do I need to do because I'm black or you're white or I'm black. They were just being happy because it was just an emotion. And then this quote is by the president of then the Brooklyn Dodgers. Now it's the Los Angeles Dodgers, right? But they started out back in Brooklyn. So integration in baseball started public integration on trains, in Pullmans, which is a train, in dining cars, in restaurants in the South, long before the issue of public accommodation became news. So it was one way in baseball to start integration where blacks and whites were together and people started to see they needed to not be judging people by the color of their skin. So Larry Doby, good one to look up. I hope you enjoyed the book. I'll talk to you next time. Bye.